Okay. So, um, hello. My name is Kate Stewart. I'm VP at uh, the Lynx Foundation, and one of the projects I spend a lot of my time working with is the Zephyr Project. And I've been with the Zephyr Project since its beginning. In 2015, it was one of the first projects I started working on at the LF. And um, what I would want to tell you a bit about is um, I've also been working in open source for a long time and been very involved with the Linux kernel. And I liked a lot of the practices of the Linux kernel. And so some of these ones we tried to explicitly use in Zephyr, and so I want to sort of show you and talk to you about some of these practices. So um, it's changed a bit since I started, but it's still pretty much the same. Um, in the sense that there's a lot of open source R tosses out there. And the question becomes is which ones to use and where should you spend your time? And so one of the things I've started tracking about in 2018 is um, what is actually happening in them. So every month for a three or four years, now I just do it every quarter now, I would go in and I would go onto GitHub and all of these projects are on GitHub. And so one of the things is, if you, and this is where those numbers came from, okay? So you go to the project and you see how many commits there are and the total contributors and that's on the first page. And then if you go into the monthly summary, you'll see how many people push things in the last month and how many commits they've got. And if you take the uh, number of commits, monthly commits, and you divide by the number of days in the month and the number of 24 hours in the day, you get a rate, which is the how many commits per hour. And so these commits per hour is a useful sort of indicator to understand, okay, what sort of um, velocity the project is having. But when you go and look at this and you look across these, you don't even need to get to that stage to really understand. Um, I guess, well, is there a pointer? Maybe. Yes, there's a pointer. Okay, so the first commit in these projects sort of tells when they started. Then we see who controls the commits. Is it a community or is it one company? And generally you can say that if it is a community, they tend to move through a lot more innovation and a lot faster. In companies, sometimes there's a lot of innovation inside the company, but then it's just one person who can make it outside. And so that sort of skews things a bit. But then those, you see who's actually contributed. And if you look now, there's over 1,400 contributors into Zephyr as of December 1st, which is, <clears throat> well, um, Probably more than double most of everything else, possibly usually three times or four times. Actually, it's, I guess it's, it's double. This is the next highest one, so uh, for double contributors. So yeah, it's at least double the number of contributors than anything else. And in the last month, 183 people were contributed compared to the next closest was Nodex, which is a good community project. I'm not saying anything against these you know, projects but there was 49 people. And you see now over time, there has been over 70,000 commits into the project. So there's a lot of momentum. And um, there's a lot of features going in and a lot of bug fixes going in. Both are valid um, commits. And in the last month, for instance, you can see that we've had um, over 1,200, which gives us that rate of about 1.7 commits an hour. So. How does this compare to Linux, which is what I was taking as my sort of starting point? Um, well, from the 5.9 kernel, it's about nine, um, there it is, nine commits an hour. So it's about a fifth or 20% of the rate of the kernel. But given that the kernel is one of the fastest moving and the biggest projects, for an embedded OS, it's pretty significant how this all works together. So. How has Zephyr achieved this momentum is the question. And so some of these are achieved by best practices. And let's sort of think back to what Linux was like when it started back in 1991. At the same time, 
Um, there's a whole bunch of Unix sources available, Minix, BSD, SVR4, and there was a bunch of commercial, different commercial distributions. So we had a very wide set of Unixes out there. And to a large extent, Linux was a good second option. It wasn't the, you know, the best in certain features or anything else, but it was something that people could contribute to and build on. And now today with Linux, as you see, it's pretty much dominating most of the markets for an open source RTOS, except, where it's, except when it's, sometimes it's too big. And so what we're trying to do is have some equivalent for those smaller footprint places, and that's where Zephyr's coming in, and that's why we're trying to get Zephyr working. So use Linux. It's got the best features out there, if you can, but in those small sensors, the actuators, things that have to have battery life that lasts in years, tens of years even sometimes, Zephyr is worth considering because it doesn't consume as many resources. So um, in 2016, 2017, and I was at the LF here, um, there was a, I guess, uh, Greg Crow Hartman and John Corbett put out their um, Linux kernel development report. And in this version of the kernel development report, they started highlighting some of the features that um, they think where have been significant to Linux success. So one of which was um, short release cycles are important. Um, having the hierarchical developer model, having maintainers in a hierarchy, so you know how the changes will flow into the kernel. Tools matter. We all had Git, we had Git by this point in time. And there was, and a lot of the velocity of the kernel didn't happen until after Git came in place. Um, the consensus or model is important making sure that people all agree. Even sometimes that takes a long time, but it tends to be a good place for people to feel like they've not been shut out. Um, a related factor is no regressions rule. You can't make things break. Early days in the kernel, things were breaking. Um, but they, once they adopted this no regression rule, this has been part of the velocity of the kernel. Um, related factor is no, um, Corporate participation is critical. Companies, it's not just hobbyists. It's companies and people doing jobs because they can make money off of it, and there's a virtuous cycle. So having it, uh, corporates participating as well as community people and people scratching their own itches um, is what makes it effective. And there should be no internal boundaries in the project. Just because you can, you know, if you work on one driver, you should be able to go work on, you know, the print K stuff. You should not be bought, you know, blocks didn't anything. There should be no internal boundaries. So these, um, Zephyr, <coughs> Zephyr started in 2016, early 2016. So a lot of these pieces of um, recommendations as to why it's been successful, we were looking at with the project. And uh, there's a few other sort of lessons that have lear people learned. Um, keeping things vendor neutral. It's probably very important. Um, the mix of companies and individuals by scratching their own itches. Quite frankly, it's not in that set, but making it easy for people to do upstreaming work. By using the DCO, and I'm a very big fan of the DCO, um, you do not have to go through a whole bunch of lawyers generally to do contribution license agreements, and you also end up with something that is not going to shift out from under you. And this is one of the things I kind of am strong. Having the public codes, having the way of signaling who's reviewed things is a useful practice and very valuable. And then we've got the consensus-oriented decision-making, the hierarchical development model, no internal boundaries, tools matter, short predictable release cycles with fixed merge windows, and then having the stable and LTS. All of these are factors, I think, that have contributed to the success of Linux over the years. So, um, and one of the key things to understand is when developers get frustrated, they get creative and they do good things. And Linux is also showing some of that. We, wouldn't have had, we would not have Git if our inf infrastructure for uh, version control was you know, smooth. Uh, so these are the lessons learned from Linux. And so when we started Zephyr off, we wanted it to be the best in class RTOS for connected devices. And so what we wanted to do is say, OK, this is our vision. How are we going to do this? Well, one of the things we did, like most Linux Foundation projects do, 
is we focused a TSC for making the decisions about technologies. And the governing board makes decisions about money. So we separate the money decisions from the technical decisions. And I can't stress how important that is. <laughs> but, you know, the, the developers, um, we basically decide to use kconfig and kbuild from the kernel because we want to be able to configure and we want to be able to share device tree information and so forth and be only able to put in what we need it because Zephyr's, you know, targeting from like, you know, tens of Ks up to, you know, whatever you need to put in. But, uh, sorry, too much talking. But this is, <coughs> no, nope. have it. When we launched the Zephyr, there was a unified kernel. I'm oh, sorry, there was um, a nano and a micro kernel associated with it. After the first year, the developers decided, no, we can just do a unified kernel. It doesn't make sense to carry this overhead. So they changed that. Uh, we started off with Garrett and Jira. And they went, no, we want to be on GitHub and Issues. So in 2017, we moved over to GitHub and Issues, and that's helped accelerate things for Zephyr. Again, keeping it easy for people to contribute is key for people to do it. Um, our build system went from kbuild to cmake, because that's what the developers wanted to do. So um, the APIs and the hardware abstraction levels have been reworked several times um, and continue to evolve. The modularization and device tree support is key to Zephyr. And then we had started it with the view that we would go after LTSs because we saw how successful that was for the Linux kernel. So these are some of the you know, technical decisions that happened. And so taking these lessons learned I was going through from Linux, vendor neutral decision making. Well, yes, the project has support from multiple companies. All you have to do is look at the history right now and you'll see no one company will dominate Zephyr. You see, a lot of, you know, certain companies have more contributions than others, but we are not, um, I was very conscious of not having an elephant factor, and we've explicitly tried to nurture a lot of companies participating. Companies and individuals participate. Um, yes, our TSC has both in them. Um, we streamlined the upstream process. Again, you can see the contributing document, and we use the DCO. So it's very easy to just start contributing and sending patches and then pull requests into Zephyr. As long as you agree to the license as per the DCO, and the license for most, pretty much all the code in Zephyr is Apache, too. Um, there's public code reviews. All the pull requests have to be signed off by um, at least one, I think sometimes two people, depending on where it is in the kernel we're heading to. The consensus or decision making. TSC, sometimes people will disagree on the issue in the pull request. No surprise. A lot of the discussion happens there, actually. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes they get escalated to the TSC for the discussion. But there's a forum. And it's not one person making a decision. It gets in front of all the TSC voting members, and they get to vote. So the consensus is happening that way. Um, we have the maintainers file. And we've, we, I think we had co-noters initially. We've moved from having maintainers formally. And so you can see exactly who maintains which part of the subsystem. One of the things we're trying right now is the notion of co-maintainers. And so we can onboard new people into maintaining. Because a lot of the times the, pipe, the problem um, is the pipeline of maintainers and the bandwidth of maintainers, because they're doing this sometimes in addition to their job. No internal boundaries, same thing. Uh, see the contributing for the distributed version control. We have a 10, <coughs> the Linux kernel has a two week merge window and then uh, several weeks of stabilization. Um, Zephyr's chosen to have a 10-week merge window and then two to four weeks of stabilization. And that's working for us so far. As Zephyr potentially gets bigger, they may revisit that discussion, but this is working right now. And then long-term support. We actually had um, uh, first long-term support, long-term support one, had four release updates, and we're on long-term support two. And we, so every two years, we get an LTS for this project. So as you can sort of see, we've been trying to apply these lessons we've learned from Linux 
into Zephyr. And as a result, um, we now have, we started with three architectures, and we now have all of these hardware architectures. We started off with the M core from ARM, Arc Synopsys, and Intel x86. 64 bit has been added, A cores and R cores have been added, and then 32 and 64 bit RISC um, 5. And most recently, the people started putting some of the MIPS um, architectures in there because they wanted a place to pick up some of the new communication technologies. And so by putting a new architecture in here, you get suddenly the value of all these other drivers that are already there and all these sensors that are there. The architecture at this point in time is pretty complete, or at least has a lot of good tech communication technologies. There's things we still want to add. Um, like, for instance, I'd love to get, I'm talking to some of my mem you know, some of the members and some of the community people about seeing if we can get matter in to Zephyr and getting matter stack into Zephyr. Um, and then, then there's, but we've got a very good Bluetooth low energy stack as well as Bluetooth mesh and um, the audio. So the Bluetooth stacks are very well tested, reliable, and they're all integrated. You don't have to get something else extra and bring it into Zephyr because all of this is sitting in the code repo. It's all under kconfig. It's all config, like say, you basically config it in through device tree and you, it's there on those images you're building which makes it very fast to go to market and to get new things working. Um, this, we follow a structure of our code repositories where we are getting the development happening at that rate of 1.7 an hour. And then every two years we cut our long-term support. This will get, if there's a vulnerability or a bug, key bug fix, this gets updated. And then a subset of this is what we're doing the full traceability on as part of doing it, something taking it to auditable. And this is what we'll be taking to 615, get 61508 certifications on. So if there's anything that has to change, we're trying to make sure it's all kept up to, say, up to speed. And um, this is how we're dealing with the fact that you don't want to take things to safety unless they're moving too fast. So we're trying to work upstream and then have that LTS ready to go. So LTS, like the Linux kernels, product focused. We're keeping current with security. But we're not putting, you know, but we're not putting new features into it other than potentially people may want to use it for new hardware and put their own versions of new hardware in. And it is, has a much longer testing cycle and we try to keep it supported for two years. The Linux kernel has different variant points for their LTSs and then the uh, civil infrastructure platform is even trying to make it longer. Um, if we find um, community people that want to be maintaining this for longer periods of time, the discussion I think will start. But it's not feature-based and it's not cutting edge. However, when you're making products, you don't want that necessarily. If it has the features you need, you don't want it to be changing out from under you, but you do want the security fixes if it's significant. And we basically have demonstrated by doing, and so we've had four LTS updates that have come out in the last few years, and Auditable is being worked on right now. Uh, the modularity is happening by device tree and kconfig, and <clears throat> Um, this lets us potentially share some of the device information with the kernel um, drivers, as well as kconfig lets us figure out exactly what goes in. And so you only put in what you need. It's statically compiled in at build, okay? So you, you're not bringing in a lot of cruff that you don't need, and this will let us keep these images small. What about security? Big topic, right? Um, Zephyr uh, was one of the first adopters of the um, OpenSSF badge, and we became passing within the first year after it came out. Interestingly enough, you saw those de de the decisions that the developers made about changing infrastructure and things like that. We stopped passing because we didn't update our documentation and the websites weren't working. So uh, this is, kept, you know, has some automatic checking behind. So once we saw that it failed us, it's like, oh, we've got to get passing again. And yeah, we may as well try to go for gold. So Zephyr is one of the earlier projects to actually has achieved the gold level. You can see all our processes documented. And there's currently about um, almost 5,000 projects right now, and only 12 have gold badges. So like I say, we're taking these types of best practices very seriously. Um, you know, 
the nice thing about doing badging, and I would encourage any project that you're working with to try for it, is it gives you a framework for figuring out and adding best practices. It sort of guides you through improving your security posture. And it also helps you create onboarding <laughs> material for people in the security team. And it is pretty transparent. It lets you be transparent about attesting to what you're doing in the project for other people who are coming in. So I encourage you to go look at Zephyr's badge. Go look at what we're saying. If you think something's stale, open an issue. We'll fix it. <laughs> but this is sort of like our public documentation of the things that are important for security. The other thing that the Zephyr Project has done is we actually registered as a CVE numbering authority. Most CVE numbering authorities are companies. But we felt it was important that we manage, because there isn't a lot of companies, and it's multiple companies, it's not just one company, we wanted to manage our own vulnerabilities. And so we have a security team that brings in, gets the information for vulnerabilities as, and has a you know, project security incident response team, or PSERT, as volunteers from our you know, various members in the community. And they're the ones who are reviewing this and working with the security architect and then deciding if things get fixed or responding back and getting more information. Um, we want Zephyr to be using products though, right? So um, when there's a vulnerability, people need time to fix it in the field. And what we wanted to do was make sure we have an embargo period um, so that you know things don't get exploited or shared before their time. So the Zephyr team is you know, committed to fixing things within 30 days and then give vendors 60 days under embargo so they can update the products that they're building on those issues. So this type of information, I think, helps people balance between what's upstream and what they've got for products. And that's what we're trying for. So to sort of summarize what we've, how the evolution has, work, has been working, um, the security team started right at the start of the project. It meets bi-weekly. The secure product coding practices were documented. Sorry. <coughs> Um, we registered as the CVE numbering authority and been working with the upstream vulnerability management systems. The best practices badge was met in 2019. We're doing a lot of automation. There's a lot of testing that goes on um, with Zephyr on every commit. And uh, we're doing periodic covarity scans and measure scans to ensure the code base is kept clean. Um, we did some improvement on our vulnerability management in 2021 as a result of um, a bulk vulnerability report one of which was changing our process for the embargo, the other of which was making it so that people who have products, so if you've got a product that's using Zephyr and you want to be notified, you don't need to become a member. It'd be nice if you did to help support the infrastructure, but you can register for free. You just have to let us know and point us to your public product. And then you can effectively get the notifications under embargo, for the embargo period. And then in 2021, um, Source S bombs have been created by Zephyr since 2.5. However, automatically generating a system bill of materials for the built image was added to the build infrastructure for Zephyr. So Zephyr right now, um, with one command line change, uh, you can basically generate two source S bombs, one for the Zephyr sources, one for your application sources, and then a build S bomb, which points back to those source S bombs. So you have traceability to exactly which source files made it into your libraries and which libraries combined to make it into your final ELF image. This level of traceability is key in embedded because what we need to do is not try to fix things that aren't broken in places. Um, an example of this was FNet, okay? So Amnesia 33 happened a few years ago and it had a version of FNet in our LTS1. TIP didn't have it anymore, but FNet was in LTS. If you just looked at the version numbers, you would think, oh, okay, I've got to go and replace everything. Well, actually, when you go down to the source file level and you see it, none of those FNet sources that had the vulnerability were actually in the Zephyr tree. You had, if you just looked at the version number, you would have wasted a lot of time and effort, which is why we need this traceability because ex updating things in embedded in the field is expensive. 
It's not just pushing a button, it suddenly goes there. Although, you know, there's, there's systems that are working in that direction. Um, but being authoritative and knowing you're fixing only what you need to fix, you need to have this level of information. So what are the results of applying these best practices? Well, there's uh, 4,400 forks of Zephyr out there right now. And so part of our challenge <laughs> is figuring out, okay, what are people doing with some of these forks? And some of them you get by word of mouth, and some of them you get by, you know, looking at things and, you know, digging around. Um, there's a, a board up in Brazil that's uh, working off of Zephyr that we learned about over the summer from talking to people. Um, and we also see smart devices, so we're talking to people creating devices. And so people are adding AI to Zephyr, like TensorFlow Lite, types of things, and training Zephyr to do simple things. So this one here is um, electrical grid monitoring. So they're looking for anomalies on electrical grid. And this box here has to be working for 10 years, OK? Because you don't want to be climbing up the, lab, the, the pole to be changing it. Um, but it's sending information. Um, this one here is sitting on the top of garbage cans, big dumpsters. and understanding what's actually in there, and are they full enough that you have to call it, get a truck to come by and dump it or not. So you're not running around all the time dumping things that are empty, but you can be a bit more selective. And then, any, okay, show of hands, who's actually been on the ice trains in Germany, the Deutsche Bahn? Okay, well, just one hand. Anyhow, these are like the bullet trains here in Japan. Oh, no, no, no. No, no? German, but they're not. They're not? Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Anyhow, um, one of the latest ones we've figured out recently is uh, we learned about, there was a talk in German that I couldn't understand, but people have translated it for me. Um, and this sensor pump has Zephyr in it. And it basically pumps out the wastewater tank and makes sure that it's properly empty so the trains stay in service and that they don't have to stop. So combining AI with these very lightweight sensors and these systems gives us a way of doing something that is slight, you know, it's um, more than just heuristics. We can actually train things. And then there's a variety of other products that are out there that we found. So if anyone here in this room has a product running Zephyr, please tell, tell me about it so I can make it visible. Because <laughs> embedded is hard to find products. Um, but Oticon's hearing aids here, oops, there we go. These ones here, um, their whole line is running Zephyr, okay? Um, wind turbines are running Zephyr. So we've got this whole spectrum uh, from smartwatches. Um, tagging devices are running Zephyr. And one of the ones that you'll be seeing showing up next year is next generation. And it's public because they gave a talk about it, so I can say it. But the next generation of Google Chromebooks will have Zephyr in it to monitor things in the low power state. So they'll be running Linux on part of it and then Zephyr on other parts. And we've seen these types of uses where you use Zephyr for the low power side of it and minim minimal sucking of power and resources. Okay. And for all these applications, there's over 400 boards in the repo right now. So if you've got a board or you're working with another board, it's a good chance it's probably already have a port to Zephyr there. And if it isn't there, there's probably something that's close that you can work from. Because these are all devices and they're standard interfaces and, you know, there's only so much IP there. So I would encourage you to look in the repo directly. Uh, given the link is here, boards.html. Pretty straightforward. If you're familiar with working around the Linux kernel repositories, you'll find it pretty familiar. There's the architecture, the boards, and so forth. And there's over 100 sensors integrated already. So, you know, picking up these sensors, picking up these boards, evolving things, putting new configs in, is how we're getting all those commits. The bulk of the commit work is happening by new boards, new sensors, new technologies, and integrating different ways. Okay. And we, there's a native IP stack already integrated. So you have, including, you know, You've got full IPv4, IPv6, you've got time sensitive networking, you've got BSD sockets API, iFloating, and so forth. And we do a lot of um, 
testing. We're using the Maxwell Pro for testing to make sure we don't regress in there. So we're trying to use some of the commercial services. And so this is what, quite frankly, membership bought, you know, membership helps us support, because those aren't cheap. And so that's kind of what's going on there. We have a wide range of protocols, common protocols for communicating out, and we are supporting a wide range of technologies here on the networking side already. And Bluetooth host and mesh technologies are there. Um, the low energy and Bluetooth classic are there. So as you can see, um, they, Bluetooth SIG actually uses Zephyr for prototyping um, new specs. So there's a group that's in Zephyr and also in the Bluetooth SIG, and when they're working developing the new specifications, they'll work in a private repo um, to make sure that the specification is solid, and then when the specification becomes public, it's there for Zephyr. So we are kept very close to the edge of the Bluetooth, and I'd like to have that type of arrangement in some other places too. And then low energy, obviously, because Zephyr really cares about the low energy. And don't worry, I'll put these slides up after, OK? Um, but you're welcome to take pictures. It's fine. And then we have a fairly complete USB stack. Um, and remember, you know how I said we have TensorFlow Lite in those smart devices? Well, there's two samples of TensorFlow being integrated with Zephyr already sitting in our documentation repo to show you how to start doing it. One is a very simple sine wave one. And this other one here is for like a magic wand. So you have the training and you can get the information and so forth. So these are here to help people on ramp and help people start to work with the code base effectively and hopefully not have too big a learning curve. We're wanting to work, continue to improve our learning curve, just to be clear. We're not, we know we're not perfect yet. <laughs> you have to download some things and you know, things like that. But um, this is an area that the TSE is very much focused on. And then we get to S-bombs. <laughs> and one of the nice things about this is on once you say S, um, West SPDX, after that, your builds um, with West will generate evidence for your the Zephyr sources, the C's and H's, the app sources, and then which C's, which objects, .os and so forth, make it into a libraries, and then which libraries together make it into the ELF. So you're given an ELF image, and you have your build SBOM, and you can trace it all the way back to exactly which files are there. And they're hashed, and so you have that trust level. And as we take things that have to last for a long time, knowing that you can be authoritative about exactly which sources made it in there is going to be key. And if you want to see, you know, you don't have to believe me here. <laughs> um, there's a dashboard. I've got the link to it here. And um, Reno, um, Ant Micro is one of the members of the project, and they put this Renode simulator up there, and they simulate all these configurations. And so they actually have a dashboard that they keep everything running, and they do things built and passed the testing. And anything that says built or passed has those three S bombs in it, because it is that easy. And so if you're interested in seeing what a good S bomb looks like, I think there's um, one of the uh, members of the SPDX community, uh, Steve Winslow, did the work in CMake to actually make it happen. So th the quality of these are pretty high for S-bombs. And they're just generated automatically. So I encourage you to look at them. So I guess this sort of summarizes what the Zephyr project is. And you know, <coughs> it's there to fit when Linux is too big, OK? Um, it's not a replacement for Linux, but it is there to augment Linux. And we have a fairly vibrant community. We have vendor neutral governance. It's permissively licensed, so you don't have to worry about patents because people are contributing to it saying that, you know, patent grant. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, too much talking. Okay. It's modular. And it's development, and we started it off with safety and security in mind, and we're working towards proving it out. The architecture is very complete, so it tries to let developers just focus on their applications. That's what we're really trying to do here. Okay. So if you want to learn more, um, go look at our community pages. The code's up on GitHub. 
We have a variety of mail lists. And a lot of the community works in Discord. There's about 4,000 people in Discord right now. And this is where the discussions are happening. If you click on that link, you get an automatic invite. And there's various channels for companies and various channels for um, technologies, marketing, and so forth. So like you know, jobs, um, new products, things like that. So I encourage you to go onto the Discord. And if you've got a new product, tell people about it that's using Zephyr. Um, the developers are interested in learning that their code is being used in places. It makes them, you know, it's exciting for us. With that, does anyone have any questions? Go for it. Mm -hmm. So first of all, thank you very much. This is a really, really interesting talk, and I'm, I'm really glad uh, to learn about Zephyr. Um, First off, I just want to uh, second the things you're saying about the gold best practices badge and the open SSF. I have two, like both the Tough and in Total Project went through that process also. And um, that those standards in particular are actually very useful. Um, I've seen other recommendations lists that are very dubious in some of the things they recommend. And I'm not saying that everything on the open SSF uh, badging list is 100% perfect, but it's all very good and very close. And it's a good starting point. Yes, it's it's mm -hmm. great. Okay, so um, my question is, is that I I took a look at Goliath. I'm not sure that I'm saying Goliath. that. Goliath. Yeah. Okay, it is pronounced Goliath. Okay, <laughs> it's just spelled. Okay. All right. Um, I took a look at it, and it doesn't seem like they have um, the concept that a key might be compromised or a repository might be compromised as part of of the threat model for how they do updates. And there are other open source available things mm -hmm. that have that threat model. Um, are you interested in having them contributed to Zephyr or? Yes. OK, great. Yeah. Goliath is one of our members. And they have certain technologies they keep in house. And they've got certain things that they work on upstream, like all companies do. And so um, getting best practices contributed upstream to Zephyr, we very much welcome. Great. Thank you. And would we work directly with you, or would we work with them? Um, you'd work with the community, because you'd be contributing to Zephyr. OK, thank and you. And so uh, just put in the, start putting in the pull request into the Zephyr repo. Possibly put an RFC up, and let people know what you're doing, and let have a discussion before you, so you can figure out how to structure it and not waste time. And then um, start up streaming. And if there's issues, reach out to me, please. I, I would very much like to get some of these technologies up there. All right, thanks. OK. Any other questions? Think you had one here? OK. Uh, uh, in my experience in committing to Zephyr, mm -hmm. uh, the project is uh, very well uh, managed. Uh, uh, I deeply agree what they say in these presentations. Bit far from the, this right, I have two questions about Zephyr. Uh, first question, uh, I know the Zephyr rapidly grows for, forward, especially EU region. Uh, uh, compared to that, I, it may not get much attention in Japan. This is why we have printed out <laughs> one page summaries so that it's okay, very okay. visible to the Japanese to make it easy, so if you don't have one and you want one, please pick it one is, up. It is very... This is what we've mm. got here. Uh, in, in my viewpoint, uh, uh, that is because uh, Japanese industry has a unique real-time operating system ecosystem that grows with uh, governmental support. <laughs> uh, but I want to uh, more popularize Zephyr in Japan. Oh, well, we uh, would welcome to start uh, having meeting groups and things like that mm. for Zephyr users. That would be wonderful. So please let me know who you are, and I will reach out to you afterwards. And you maybe become a Zephyr ambassador if you are supporting Zephyr. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, second question. Uh, I understand that Zephyr intended to use it in critical system. We are wanting to use it uh, there. We have uh, to go through the safety certification mm, 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 mm. first. Uh, but uh, in, in other hand, uh, beyond the project that putting goods to uh, origin API to Zephyr, uh, I'm keeping an eye on it because it is a large region that can applicate to the Zephyr. Okay. Uh, uh, are there uh, any area for, where you expect Zephyr to expand? Ex <laughs> so, uh, 
sorry. Uh, expand its applications. Um, I expect Zephyr to continue to collect cores. There's a lot of um, DSPs out there um, that really don't have a good support plan. And um, there's been discussions potentially of getting Zephyr used for them. I might see that coming in. As there's new architectures that are emerging in Risk V, some of these are definitely being followed and looking at getting them in. So they're giving me the stop signal at the back, but thank you for the very good questions. And I'm on got the Thank you, everyone. And please feel free to pick up stickers at the front and uh, those brochures if you would like. Thank you.